Welcome to the Transform Podcast. My name is Andrew Farhat. Grateful that you're tuning in. And today we are going to talk about um, a topic that many are interested in understanding from a biblical perspective, and that is, what does the Bible say about sex? And today we have my bride, Daisy, who is our guest today. Hello. And this is a topic, Daisy, I think that we have to hit from God's perspective as our creator, because if we don't talk about it, who's going to talk about it? The world is, has plenty to say about sex. The world has plenty to say about it. The culture has plenty to say about it. And so what we want to do is, and we always give away our presupposition on this podcast that we believe in and love and trust Jesus. Uh, so we believe that he is savior of the world, that he is Lord. Uh, we actually believe that he's God in the flesh. So very strong belief we have there. Um, and that we, we also believe that he inspired the Holy Scriptures. So the question is, what does the Bible say about sex? So uh, if you believe that the scriptures are your authority, then this is uh, exceedingly useful to you. Uh, if you don't believe that the scriptures are your authority, um, and then I think that this could simply be educational for you to, tr to try to understand uh, where the scriptures are coming from on issues that have to do with sex. Mm -hmm. And so, you ready? I'm ready. All right, so here we go. First thing I would say is, I think we need to frame the conversation uh, within the th biblical framework of creation, mm -hmm. fall, and redemption. So creation, God made them male and female, and he created the gift of sex to be utilized within the covenant of marriage. Uh, this is all in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So right at the very beginning, which is really interesting, from the beginning of time, God establishes his perfect design uh, and beauty for this relationship in creation. But then in Genesis chapter 3, so really quick, we rebel against that design that God has. Uh, and then there's what's called a fallen world and a distorted view of everything mm -hmm. from sex to relationships to how we take care of the environment to all kinds of things. Um, and so... Uh, I think that what we see in the world is that we have a lot of that Genesis 3 mm -hmm. right now, especially when it comes to sex. Mm -hmm. But yet, uh, in Genesis 3 too, there is the proclamation of a Savior who's going to come. So God preaches the gospel right away uh, in Genesis chapter 3, and we believe that that person's Jesus. And so if you are here, or you're listening, and you're experiencing any form of sexual addiction, uh, you're struggling with intimacy deficits, you're struggling with thoughts you don't want to have, but they keep coming. Uh, if you're struggling with flirting with someone who's not your spouse, whatever you're struggling with, we believe that there's a God who can take your situation, redeem it, and give you new life and you hope, and you don't have to uh, continue to live in bondage or guilt around, or shame around those things. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so creation, fall, redemption. Let's talk about creation. So right out of the gate, I think what we have to say is that sex is a gift. Mm -hmm. So one author uh, in the past, a book that we were familiar with in the past, it said that sex can either be God, gross, or gift. So what he was saying is we can make it a God like our culture is and make it like the ultimate pleasure, end all, be all, every movie is about, you know, something really romantic. Uh, and then conversely, gross is when the cultures, you know, like the, the conservative Christian culture only talks about sex within the framework of what's forbidden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then if all you hear about what's forbidden with relationship to something, then I don't, I don't think you're really hearing it as a gift. No, and I think they're, you know, especially our generation, I don't think that's talked about so much now, but in our generation, I think that is often how the conservative Christian community talked about sex was something forbidden. And so I think a lot of people have grown up with misconceptions around healthy sexuality in marriage because of that. So I think this is really important what you're saying, like it's very important to know that it is a gift and how to use it appropriately. Absolutely. And Daisy, what do people tend to do when something's forbidden? Well, they can either go crazy and overindulge, 
because um, that restriction just is too much for them to bear or it can just create unhealthy thought patterns and then go in, you know, you can go into marriage not understanding what sex is and what it's for and then that can really create some problems with your spouse because you are either um, scared of having sex or not really knowing how to create that intimacy. Absolutely. So um, in scripture, it also tells us that if we emphasize only what's forbidden, our sinful natures will be curious about what is it. You know? And so, so that's why I think we are going to go back to the gift. So this is God's gift in creation. Genesis 1 verse 26, it says that he made us male and female. That means biologically we are male or female. That there's a particular wiring. There, there is a, a design uh, of manhood and womanhood. Um, and we can unpack that on another episode. But I think that there's, and this is something he calls good. Male, female. But then Genesis 2, verse 24, he goes right into marriage, right out, right out of the gate. And it says that a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast, that's a covenant word, to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So covenant means I'm going to bind myself to you for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. So I just quoted a marriage vow. It's mm -hmm. a covenant. Now, a covenant, uh, historically, was stated before God and witnesses. So it's not a private thing. Mm -hmm. It's a public thing. So it is, Daisy, I commit myself to you, and I'm going to do it in front of friends and family and before God. It's not, Daisy, I'm going to take you out to Chipotle, and we're going to get married. <laughs> but rather, we're going to do this as a public act, because covenants were public acts mm -hmm. that involved people. It, so that's something that I think is interesting is sometimes we think of everything in such individualistic terms. So I want to be with you. You're my soulmate. But you know, me doing that affects your brother. It affects your parents. It affects your friends. It affects your community. Um, so it's not just as simple as me saying, I want to just, you know, get married to you private, privately uh, at your apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, um, so a covenant in scripture was a public act, and then it says you become one flesh. Mm -hmm. So that means you're going to become one physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. You're going to join your lives together in oneness. So this is the biblical design. So, as, so the Bible teaches that as you prepare for this, um, it's, it's truly a process of growing and preparing for the beauty of what's coming. And certainly marriage is a gift of romance and life and joy and laughter and planning and, and so many things. And so it's, it's a beautiful thing. But until then, you're kind of hoping to prepare yourself to be the best husband you can be for your wife or the best wife you can be for your husband. Um, and I think that's another uh, framework for another podcast on marriage where <laughs> the Bible talks a lot about you not finding someone that just meets all your needs, mm -hmm. but you're, you are preparing to die for the other person daily. You're preparing to serve the other person daily. And that's the biblical framework. So I guess right out of the gate, I think I would just stop and say, God's design is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to kind of pause there and acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. He's made us male and female. He has said, hey, I have a gift for you. It's called marriage and it's called and you're going to have sex within marriage and it's going to create intimacy and it's go it's a beautiful thing for you. Uh, so I think just right out of the gate, I'd like to just thank God for that. Because mm. I think what we tend to do is say, well, can I do this instead? Mm -hmm. uh, why not this? Or, you know, is this allowed or whatever? But can we just stop and say, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, what I think what's interesting is that um, marriage isn't something that Christians believe in as a Christian thing that Christians do. It's something that's, I think, really been culturally done forever. Like all cultures have marriage. 
And so it's something that um, is a blessing to all people, not just people who believe in the Christian God and in Jesus. This is really um, the way that the world works most functional, functionally over you know, all time. There, that's important to state. So, so marriage is not a sacrament of the church. Mm -hmm. It is governed by the state because it's for everybody, regardless of your faith. It's an it's a institution. You know, and it's for everyone. Um, but what would you say, Daisy, about loving God's design versus rebelling against it and that kind of dynamic? Like, wouldn't you say we have a propensity to want to just go with Genesis 3, sinful nature, and say, um, well, can I just do this and this and this and this instead? Yeah, I think, you know, that's the temptation that we all face. But I think both our experience and then and the experience of most of the people that we know, that doesn't... It doesn't lead to joy, it doesn't lead to contentment, that lifestyle of trying to get as close to the edge as possible and saying, well, can I, can I do this and still not break the rules? Like eventually you're, you're not gonna be content, you're not gonna be satisfied with that way of life. Um, we've really found that in following God's design, um, it's not simply to follow the rules that God has in place, but it really is a blessing to our lives. It really brings joy and fruitfulness and contentment to our own lives. And so um, should we follow God's design because he said so? Well, yes, but I think we also need to recognize that there's, there's a reason that there is the design that he's made. And the reason for that is, is it's a great blessing to us. Absolutely. So um, what we are saying then is that um, we have a propensity to want to get to the edge of the cliff. But what if we said, hey, let's, let's enjoy what God's given. And what he's given is husband and wife and marriage, having sex, but more importantly, sacrificing themselves for the good of the other. Mm. And that's God's beautiful design. And I think what we've seen uh, historically, culturally, by way of observation and also by way of study, is that whenever we go outside of that design, we make a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to acknowledge that. So, but here is what scripture also says about the beauty of God's design and sex within marriage. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 through 19. This is from Wisdom Literature. This is written from a father to a son. Um, and he says this. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Um, there's some eye-opening language here, isn't there? Yeah. Like it's like, whoa, this is in the Bible. So let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. And it uses the word a lovely deal, deer, a graceful doe. Like, what do you want to do with a lovely deer and a graceful doe? Uh, you want to be physically affectionate. You want to pet it. You want to have touch. Um, and so it's giving you this alarming, uh, beautiful imagery there. And then it says, let her breast fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated. I think we, I think we think of intoxication as being drunk. But what it's saying is be drunk with her love. Mm. So I think there's an invitation here for married couples. And I think also the book Song of Songs, which is also in the Old Testament, right in the middle of the Bible. It's a, it's a very, I think, graphic book about sex yeah. within the context of marriage. It's so graphic that uh, many church, or rather many Jewish theologians and early church theologians thought it was just a metaphorical book referring to Christ and the church. Mm. They didn't want to see it as a literal book about a husband and wife having sex. But there has been definitely newer studies uh, in the church that have said, well, it's actually a both and. Mm -hmm. It's not an either or. Mm -hmm. um, and that God has given the gift of sex, and it fits with Proverbs, that we would be intoxicated with each other's love. And so the Bible teaches that sex within marriage should be free and frequent um, and that it creates intimacy and it also guards against intimacy deficits. Mm. And I think couples uh, should take note of that as we get busy, as our children rule every part of our lives, <laughs> uh, that we would 
see that scripture desires us to keep this as a priority. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any comments on that, Daisy? Yeah, I think um, intimacy, sexual intimacy is definitely a great um, part of guarding against those intimacy deficits. But I think, you know, it's more than that too. You have to have emotional, relational intimacy as well. And all of those really flow and work together as a whole. Um, so I think, you know, we talked about earlier, if, if you're experiencing deficits in your, in your marriage, if it's relational or emotional or um, any area, like it's really important to figure out what's going on there and address those deficits because um, if they're not addressed, it could you know, lead to trouble down the road. It could lead to you um, establishing intimacy with someone who's not your spouse. And maybe that might seem innocent at first, but those you know, emotional attachments start happening and then it's, it's a bad road to start going down. Um, so counseling is a great area if you are experiencing some deficits or just you know, start off by talking to your spouse and saying, hey, this is an area where I feel like maybe we need to address this. Like, what are we going to do to address this? What's our plan? Because I don't want this emotional deficit to keep going and get worse. Absolutely. So, so what I heard you say is relational intimacy should be the foundation for sexual intimacy. It should flow out of it. Because obviously, if you're like, okay, we have to have sex because we want to guard against intimacy deficits and I have to do it. Uh, that's different than I get to do this and it flows out of the relational intimacy that we already have. And so I think what you're getting at is, all right, hit, let's talk about the relationship. So what, uh, if you're listening today, I think what we would hope for married couples is that they would state or they would ask, is there an intimacy deficit that I have in my marriage? And if so, why is that? And it could be, uh, not being intentional around it. It could be that you've established rhythms that don't leave any space for it. Um, it could be that kids are dominating, like that you have no ability to have boundaries with your kids, to be able to say, hey, uh, at 8.30 p.m., that's when I spend a little bit of time dating your mom because when we're healthy, the whole family is going to be healthy. So in Scripture... You're my priority before my children are my priority. Now, they're all priorities, mm -hmm. but Scripture wants me to put you first mm -hmm. and make sure that we're good because that's going to flow out and, and be an overflow of blessing for them. And conversely, if we're not doing well, man, that's going to overflow to them as well. Uh, so what is it? Is it, too, is it workaholism? Mm -hmm. Is it children? Is it you know, your bed is not a romantic place because children are always there or dogs are always there and it smells. Um, like, what is it? I think people have to consider that when we talk about intimacy deficits. And then I think for, I think everyone's vulnerable, but I think especially those who are in their midlifes, um, if there are intimacy deficits, you are setting yourself up to be vulnerable to the opposite sex flirting with you and catching you uh, when you're not prepared for that. Um, and so I think that uh, husbands and wives that are married have to be also uh, aware of this. Scripture says this in Proverbs 6, verse 27 and 28. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burnt? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So you might think, oh, I'm texting another woman or I'm uh, flirting with another woman or, you know, uh, sh you know, I'm doing a play date with another woman and then it can escalate. And so before you know it, um, you might be friends, you know, with that, with the opposite sex. And you may think it's just innocent or, or whatever, but then all of a sudden, you know, there is... There are things that can happen here. Um, so for men and women, I think that there's an invitation here to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. Boundaries are, you know, you have wisdom around, all right, there's some lines that I'm not going across. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to be friendly with everyone, but there's, I'm not going to be flirty. I'm going to be friendly with everyone and kind. Mm -hmm 
but I'm not going to just go on walks or dates with the opposite sex without other people around, you know? So that's an example of a boundary and a desire to have wisdom. And then I think for research would show that uh, men don't calculate what they will lose if they act on the feelings that are starting to happen mm -hmm. or whatever. So maybe they're going down a road, they have no boundaries, maybe they're mad at their spouse, maybe they're just not having intimacy with their spouse, but they don't calculate, mm -hmm. all right, if I keep going down this road, here's what's gonna happen. And you lose a lot. You may lose your job, you may lose your spouse, you may lose self-respect, you may lose friendships, you may lose respect with the opposite sex um, that maybe has heard about it. You may have to move. It, there, there's so much research on this. Typically men don't calculate all that when they're going down the road. You know, and the reality is, is this, this happens. A lot of people are going to find out, and then you have to deal with the embarrassment of everyone knowing what you've done. You know, it generally becomes somewhat of a public thing. Yes. Now, with all of that said, even if someone does fall into this, whether it's flirting or going the full nine yards, or if they're having marriage problems or intimacy deficits, the good news of the gospel is there's hope and healing. There's redemption, there's new life in Jesus, there's forgiveness through Jesus. And one thing I love about our community at St. John's, I think we're blessed to be a part of a church that practices not only authentic relationships, but liberating grace. So no matter what sin someone has committed, there's a culture of grace that, that allows the person to get healing and mm -hmm. to start over. Um, and that's huge. For sure. Okay. One thing I would say, though, about the boundaries is that is something very important to communicate to your spouse and to talk about with your spouse because I think that can create a lot of trust with your spouse knowing what each other's boundaries are. And um, it just makes me think of couples that we've known um, where one spouse has been unhappy with the boundaries that another spouse has and just how much um, conflict and unhappiness that's created in their marriage because mm -hmm. the other spouse is just constantly insecure. She's flirting with a man again. She's going, you know, somewhere with a man by herself again, and we just don't have trust in this area. And that's that doesn't create happiness or joy in a marriage. That just creates stress and insecurity. Absolutely, and I think what husbands and wives should lean in towards is pursue trust, not why don't you just accept this? Mm -hmm. So psychologically and emotionally, the more you pursue trust, the more she's going to trust you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of saying, oh, I want to do this or do that, why not just say, all right, hey, this makes you uncomfortable. I'm going to build trust with you and have these boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then over time, it just kind of goes away because yeah. you've decided to not make it this issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right, I think that, I think what we've tried to hit on here is just the relevance of scripture. So it's saying um, God's created marriage to be enjoyed. Here's how you can enjoy it. Here's how you can flourish. Have sex freely and frequently. Don't substitute it for relational intimacy, but have both. Have relational intimacy and sexual intimacy and have boundaries and uh, may God bless that. And so I guess when I hear all this, I'm like, man, I think we need to redeem the beauty of God's design here and relish and how awesome it is. All right. What about sex before marriage or uh, extramarital sex, premarital sex? And I think that this is a very controversial, common topic mm -hmm. where I think that the culture has made such strong inroads into the church that I think the church doesn't really have biblical legs anymore. And I think we're struggling with that right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with a, a word that the New Testament uses, and we'll talk about what it means. 
So we've already talked about the gift of sex and the design that God has. But then there's also this statement. It comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 uh, to verse 5, and then verse 7. As it says, you should be sanctified. This means God's calling us to be set apart. And it says that you should avoid sexual immorality. That's the Greek word porneia. It's where we get our word pornography. It is basically a word for all kinds of sex outside of, God, outside of God's perfect design of marriage. That each of you should learn to control his own body. Interesting. So like there's a beauty around control. In a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen or those who do not know God. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. So, right out of the gate, I would just say, um, there is this thought in Scripture. Chastity is to prepare yourself for something better Mm. and more beautiful Mm. and glorious. Typically, I think we talk about it just as abstinence Mm. or don't have premarital sex. Mm -hmm. But I think another way to frame the conversation is chastity. Chastity means you're, you're preparing yourself for something greater down the road, something more beautiful down the road. And you brought up something earlier that, man, I think I've talked to God. I've talked to men a lot in my life. Mm-hmm. That's a relevant thing. Man, I've had sex with so many women before um, I've married to my spouse, and they all don't measure up mm-hmm. to my spouse. So you're bringing up something that I think is real. Because sometimes when you hear about, you know, Christians say, well, you're, if you're having premarital sex, you're having sex with someone that you don't know if you're going to be married to. And it sounds like, so? Well, there's a relevant thing you just brought up, that there is an issue of comparison that I've observed. Yeah, there's comparison. And even if there's not, previous sexual partners, like, that ends up damaging your relationship with your spouse in some way. It can. It, it can, and I think we've seen that um, happen, where there's just some, some challenges there that couples have had, and I know couples that are now divorced, and that was a big issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I guess, here, here's what I want to say. I feel like we can go in such a direction of persuading people of the biblical position mm-hmm. But I wonder if we would ever get to a point where we just say, God has given me new life. He's called me to what's called death and resurrection. Death of the old self, resurrection of the new self. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, If you have any questions for us to answer uh, later on this year, you could submit those questions to hello at sjdenver.org. And we hope to be helpful to you. If you, if you feel like this uh, topic can bless any of your friends, family members, we encourage you to subscribe, follow, and share. And uh, we're grateful that you are helping us to bring renewed hope and life through Jesus Christ. And that's our mission. We'll see you next time and take care.